Galatians chapter number 3, when you buy, find verse number 13, say, I got it. I got it. Are y'all ready for this word today? Y'all better not leave me up here by myself. I'm just going to tell you. Verse number 13 says this. Christ redeemed us. Amen. I'm going to keep reading the verse, but that'll preach right there. Amen. Just those three words. Amen. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Amen. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, God, thank you for the reading of your word. Now I ask you, Holy Spirit, to preach the word. Amen. Because the flesh that is standing on the stage is unable to do it. I need your power. I need your words. Just use my vocal cords to let it resonate. But speak to hearts of people today. We love you. We praise you. And we thank you today for redeeming us. Because it's in your name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Fist bump six people or you're going to hell. Fist bump six people and say, I'm so glad you're here today. One, two, let's see, three, four. Come on now. Four, five, five, six. Six different ones. Four, five. Six, yeah, oh, seven, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Don't you dare leave here going, I'm going to heaven because I fist bump six people. <laughs> let, let me go ahead and say this too. I, I know that this is uh, uh, a little different. I mean, you're in the Tom, former Tommy Hilfiger building. Uh, where you used to get jeans, you now get Jesus. And uh, so you're in the former Tommy Hilfiger building, and we're still working on things. And, and I know that we have our nursery right next door, and sometimes you might hear a baby get the Holy Ghost or something, and, and they begin screaming. Um, but uh, just don't worry about it. We've got, we've got trained people back there. Uh, we've got Benadryl. We're good. So, so just uh, don't, don't worry about them. They may scream for just a little bit until the medicine kicks in, but then after that, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. No need for everybody to jump up and run back there. Uh, no, it's all good. It's all good. They've been instructed. Go outside if you have to until Benadryl kicks in. But it's going to be good. It's going to be good. No, so don't worry about that. we got people, and sometimes it can be worse if we, a lot of people go back there than if you just stay and hear the Word. Plus, I don't want any moving around because I want you to hear what God has to say. And I don't want you to interrupt the person that is sitting next to you. So if you can just honor us today. And uh, if your baby screams, just look at it this way. If they scream it out now, they won't scream when they get home. Amen. All right. So, and if you had fed your baby before you got them here, they wouldn't be screaming it now. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and deal with this in Galatians chapter number three. Wow. What an exciting series uh, this has already been in dealing with four I wills listed in Exodus chapter number 6. Now we read from Galatians, but I want to read for you now the base text for our message series entitled, I Will. It's found in Exodus chapter number 6, verse number 6, and here's what the Bible says. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians... I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you for my people. I will be your God. Now you know where we got the subject matter of I will. And we're going to be dealing with the I wills. And we have been dealing with that. This series began with I will bring you out of slavery dealing with how Jesus Christ leads us out of the bondage of slavery from the strongholds we have in our lives. If the truth be known, and if the stats tell us correctly, you are probably sitting next to someone today who has either been in slavery, in slavery, or headed into slavery. Because of the fact that they have strongholds in their life, they have the things in their life 
that has caused them to live in bondage because of decisions they've made, because of mistakes that they've made. I'm not knocking you down because we've all made mistakes and I'm not going to knock you down because I'm not going to come in here and act like that we are all perfect and I'm not going to act like that none of us has never been in slavery before. But I'm just letting you know there is life after slavery. There is life after bondage. And the first I will that I preached is that I will bring you out of slavery. And and if you see people raising their hands and kind of shouting and kind of moving around to the music and you're wondering what's wrong with them, there's really nothing wrong with them. They just realize they've been set free. And so you, you say, well, I can't worship like that. I would really like to be able to be set free. Well, that's good because God said in His Word, I will bring you out of slavery. I will bring you out of bondage. Anybody thankful today that you're not where you used to be? Yeah, that you're not where you used to be. Yeah. Pastor, if you knew where I used to be, you wouldn't even let me in the doors of this church. That's why we don't ask you. (laughs) You just come in and act like you've been a good Christian all your life because God says, I will bring you out of slavery. Boy, that was a great word. I loved it. Oh, I enjoyed that one. And then last week I preached this message, I will bring you out of bondage. Now, now, if you weren't here and you didn't hear the message, you may say, well, that sounds like you're preaching the same message because you said I would bring you out of slavery and then you say I will bring you out of bondage. So, Pastor, which one is it? Why are you preaching the same thing? Oh, no, no, no. The first week he said I'm going to bring you out of slavery. The second week was I'm going to get the slavery out of you. Because we're tempted when times get hard, we're tempted to revert back to the old one. Yeah. See, now that I got Jesus, I still want to slap you. No, no, I thought I was in the church of the messed up people. No, no, y'all acting like y'all been saved for a while. No, I still have that tendency. I still, I, it's just a tendency. I didn't say it was anything that I can't deal with. But every once in a while I catch it before I ever... <laughs> so, so you got to understand, uh, we, we tend to want to revert back to our old ways. Because our old way says, I would cuss you out in a heartbeat. See, or we would revert back to the old ways. So that means that now that I've been brought out of slavery and out of bondage, I'm still not whole yet because God's got to get the bondage out of me. Yes, I'm not in slavery anymore because I'm at least headed in the right direction, but I also want to live a life where I don't cut you when you make me mad. Anybody with me today? So, so it's, it's like I, I want to get out of slavery. I want to be free from this. So I got some first time people looking at me going, did he just say cut you? <laughs> You, yeah, that has to do with the offering in a second. We'll get to you. So he says, I will bring you out of slavery. But how many of you know that some of you were so bad messed up that it's taken him a little while longer to get the bondage out of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's taken him, because some of you so bad, some of you made so many bad decisions that it's taken a little longer to get the bondage out of you. You say, well, how long is it going to take? Well, the children of Israel, it took them 40 years. Walking in circles. Doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. You know what we call that? Insanity. Insanity. Yeah. So, so that's what we dealt with. And I know that some of you go, man, I really wish that I would have heard their messages. <laughs> I just preached them to you. All right. So, so we're going to learn the true meaning of a religious term today. Uh, I never want to presuppose that everyone here has been raised in church all their life. I'm not going to presuppose that you all attended vacation Bible school as kids. I'm not going to presuppose that. And where I was raised up, uh, they made us go to every vacation Bible school, every one of them. Every, you know, it was amazing that we couldn't worship with one another. But when you wanted to get rid of your kids for a few hours, you didn't care what denomination was having vacation Bible school, you were going. Uh, we're not going to worship with you and we don't think a lot of you are going to be in heaven but if you could take my cheering for about two hours <laughs> did that happen here in Bessemer or was that just North Alabama talk I, in North Alabama in North Alabama yeah North Alabama mama mama didn't care if you heard the same stuff I mean by the time we got finished with the summer we had every song memorized we knew every story we could teach it better than the people that were teaching but it didn't care whether you were Methodist Mormon Catholic or Baptist or Church of God you were going to Bible school 
So I'm not going to presuppose that you've been there. I'm not going to presuppose that everyone here knows what Sunday school is. It's amazing to me, and the more funerals I do, by the way, the more funerals I do, I am hearing of people who are walking inside of a church for the very first time in their life. Uh, so I'm not going to presuppose that we all know this terminology that all good Christians want to say. Because a lot of times we'll say these terms because we want people to think we're more holy than what we really are. And so we're going to say, I'm more than a conqueror. And you don't even know what being a conqueror means. Yeah, you want to say, I'm the head and not the tail. Yeah, I could give you King James Version for a jack. No, I'm not going to do that. But I'm just saying, you, but you've got to be very careful because of the fact that you're going to quote things that you don't even know what, what it means. Yeah, I'm the head and not the tail. Yeah, you don't even know what that means. It sounds good. Makes you feel good. Makes you feel like a good Christian. So I want to deal with this term called redeemed. I, I, want to, I want you to fully understand what this word means. And if you truly understood what this word means, every time you heard the word said, you would probably run around the church naked. I'm telling you because it's such a powerful word and it's such a great definition and it's such great encouragement that if you really knew what it meant, you would not be able to stay quiet when you hear the fact that God has redeemed you. So we're going to truly learn what it means when he says in Exodus 6 verse 6, not only I will bring you out of slavery, not only am I going to get the bondage out of you, he says, but I'm going to redeem you. Before we can apply this to our lives, we must first define what this word redeem or redemption actually means. So if you were to go right now and look up the word redeemed in your Bible, you might have to look under the word redemption. If you go to a dictionary, uh, you may find redeemed, but it's going to force you to go to the word redemption. So pastor, what does this word redeemed mean? Now listen, listen very closely, because if you miss this definition, you're going to miss this entire message, all right? Here, here's, here's the definition of redeemed. Deliverance by payment of a price. Redeem, deliverance by a payment of price. In the Old Testament, redemption uh, was applied to property, animals, persons, and even the nation of Israel as a whole, thus the text Exodus 6. In nearly every instance, freedom from obligation and freedom from bondage or danger was secured by the payment of a price. Uh, a ransom, a bribe, a satisfaction, or a sum of money paid to obtain freedom, uh, paid to obtain favor or reconciliation. In the New Testament, redemption refers to salvation from sin. Redemption refers to death and the wrath of God, deliverance from death, deliverance from the wrath of God by the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. So when we say things like Christ Jesus is our Redeemer, I know my Redeemer lives, I am redeemed, that means that there has been a price paid by Jesus Christ by which our sin has been redeemed. In the Old Testament, man could redeem property Man could redeem animals. Man could redeem slaves or prisoners who were legally obligated. But in the New Testament, only God is able to redeem from the slavery of sin. What are you saying, Pastor? Let me go down this road just for a second, all right? Because in the Old Testament, you could satisfy your debt with a payment using animals, property, slaves, that sort of thing. In the statement that I just said, I said in the New Testament, God is the only one who can redeem you from the slavery yeah. of sin. Yeah. All right, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Listen real close. With that being said, that means you cannot work your way into salvation. That means no matter how much good you do from today until Jesus comes, you cannot satisfy your own sin based on your performance or based on how good you live because no matter how good you live, it's still not going to be good enough to cover the bad that you've already had in your life. 
So, so when I say God is the only one who can redeem you, who can satisfy the debt, who can set you free from the slavery of sin, you can say all day long, I'm going to quit drinking, I'm going to put down the bottle, I'm going to quit taking hits, I'm going to do away with the drugs, I'm going to quit doing this, and I'm going to quit doing that. That's fine. You need to quit doing that stuff, but that's not going to separate you from the sin and the slavery of sin that God has control over. It's going to be the fact that you go to Him, submit yourself to Him, repent of that sin, turn your back on it, and say, I'm not not going to go that direction anymore and when I repent and go in the opposite direction of sin then and only then will God be able to satisfy the sin in your life and release you from the slavery of sin. So now, with that being said, every eyeball on this, even if you've only got one in your head, look at me right here. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. That means that not one person in this building is good enough. That means not one person sitting in the church that you came from is good enough. It only amounts to what has God taken control of. So with that being said, no one here is good enough. No one here is going to measure up. So we're all equal. No matter what I did last week, no matter what you did last night. Right there, right there, right there, right there. Well, how did he know what I did last night? Well, I mean, you're still high. But listen, so you're sitting here. You're sitting here. No matter what I did last night is the same as no matter what I did 20 years ago because we're nobody good until we go through the blood, the payment for the sin which redeemed me from the slavery of sin. This is Bible teaching. This is not preaching, but I'm about to throw it out like it's nobody's business. So in the Old Testament, you could satisfy debt. You could satisfy, you could redeem. But in the New Testament, the only way you're going to get redeemed from your sin is through God. And that leads me kind of to my first point, but I want to read this text for you real quick. Psalms 103, or Psalm 137. O Israel... Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with Him is abundant redemption. Somebody say abundant. abundant. See, see, some of you went to Hueytown, so you don't know what abundant means. Abundant redemption. Abund- oh, I'm sorry. Jess Lanier. Abundant redemption. Abundant redemption. Here, here's, here's, here's the only thing I'm going to say about this, because I could preach an hour on abundant redemption. But I'm only going to settle it and satisfy it all in this one statement. It never runs out. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. Abundant redemption. It never, it never goes out. Abundant redemption. It's not limited. Abundant redemption means he's got enough to cover all your nastiness. Abundant redemption means that I can't overdo what he can't undo because there's abundant redemption. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I could go, I could go on a tangent with that, but y'all just sat there like a bunch of bad. Our text tells us that because of Christ Jesus, we can do things that we would never be able to do while living under the penalty of sin. So my first point that I want to bring to you today, that I want you to write down, if you're taking notes, write this down. If not, write this down. Number one, I will be redeemed. Number one, I can be saved. I can be saved. Our text in Galatians 3 Verse 13 is very clear in how the death of Christ on a cross saved us from the curse of the law. Had we been held to the standard of living by the law of the Old Testament, we would be in a very terrible situation because we have a hard time keeping the Ten Commandments, much less the 613 laws. (laughs) We, We have a hard time with the Ten. And uh, if I were to stand up here and we were to go through the 613 Old Testament laws, you would freak out, but you have a hard time with 10. And the scripture is clear that if you break one law, you're guilty of all of them. Oh, really? So if I break the Sabbath, number four, that means I'm just as guilty of murder, number six. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You want to cast blame and point your religious finger at all the people that does wrong, 
But you forget number four, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And you think you're all religious because you haven't killed anybody in the last two weeks. How about the fact that you haven't had a Sabbath in the last two weeks that you've kept holy? Thou shalt have no other God before me, but you're going to condemn every robber that's in town. <laughs> this is, they, they've taught me in seminary, this is not the time to take up an offering. You need to just skip this right here and just keep going. Just, just keep going. That's why God looked over. Because of the fact, because of the fact that we were unable to clear our own sin debt. Are y'all okay this morning? Because we could not clear our sin debt ourselves. And because we have a hard time keeping the 10, much less the 613, God looked over in heaven and looked into the eyes of His only begotten Son and made a request of His Son that would change history and eternity forever. Let, Let me tell you what happened. Jesus left His position in heaven. Left His comfort of being with God. Already in His position as God. To come to earth And to, as Philippians says, empty himself. Empty himself so that he could become like you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Becoming weak as a man. And you're going to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Are you saying that Jesus Christ was weak? I can point you to Scripture that tells you that Jesus Christ was tempted to eat in a fast of 40 days in the wilderness. I could show you in the scripture where Jesus Christ said, y'all stay here. I'm going to the bottom of the boat so I can take a nap. Y'all stay right here because while Lazarus is in a tomb, it forced me to weep. So you got to understand, Jesus Christ emptied himself. Emptied himself. Taking upon him the sins of this world for him who knew no sin became sin. He who never sinned took on all the sins of the world. For him who was never an alcoholic became an alcoholic, an adulterer, and a druggie. And with the shedding of his blood and with the horrible death by way of crucifixion, With giving up his life on earth, he paved the way of redemption, allowing you and I to be saved from the penalty of our own sin. Now, it's one thing if I was going to go die for my sin, but if I had to go die for your sin, you Auburn fans would have a hard time convincing me All you people that cheer for Dale Earnhardt, y'all have a hard time convincing Yeah, hard time. For all you people that work in Washington, you would have a hard time convincing me that I'm going to die for your sins. But Jesus Christ set aside himself, set aside his own agenda of being God in heaven and said, Daddy, I'll go. Daddy, I'll go. Daddy, they can't do it themselves. Daddy, they need some help. Daddy, daddy, here's the thing. Daddy, I'll go. God says, son, you do realize that you're going to have to bleed. His son said, daddy, I understand. I'll go. I'll go. You do understand, son, they're going to spit on you. That's all right, daddy. I'll go. I'll go. Why are you not getting excited? He said, son, you do realize that they're going to have to crucify you, which is the most horrendous Roman death that could take place. Jesus sat there without blinking an eye and without hesitation. And he said, but you got to understand, Dad, if I don't go, they're going to be responsible for their own penalty of sin. Daddy, I know it's going to be rough. Daddy, I know it's going to be tough. Daddy, I know it's going to be painful. But, Daddy, I got to go. Because if I don't go and shed my blood, then they're going to die and go to hell. They need to be redeemed, and I want to be their redeemer. (laughs) 
He paved the way of redemption, allowing you and I to be saved. Christ did in his death what the law could not do. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free or has saved you from the law of sin and of death. Romans 8, 3 says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. Y'all okay that I use Bible to preach, right? God did it sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh because how can you die for a penalty of sin if you don't take on the personality that contains the penalty of sin? So he says in the word that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering, a payment. That right there is redemption. That's, That's where we're redeemed right there as offering us a payment, an offering for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. This is the picture of redemption by which I can be saved. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen again. Not only did he do this so I can say that I can be saved, but he also did this so I can say I can serve. Oh, I can serve. Once your salvation is in place, you will no doubt hear a good pastor trying to get you to serve. Why? That's the least you can do for a God after He has saved you from your stuff. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. How about this? How about this? You partied hard for the devil. Why can you not serve hard for God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that old stinking devil took you down a road and caused you a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of pain. Can you not at least step out and serve and do a little something, something for Jesus Christ who was your redeeming payment for your sin, who brought you all the way from the bar stool, brought you all the way from the drug dealer's house, brought you all the way from the adulterer's house, brought you all the way from the cussing stage, brought you all the way from wanting to kill somebody, brought you all the way from wanting to roll somebody's yard, brought you all the way from being hateful, brought you all the way from being your nasty self. At least if he brought you that far and gave you a 150th chance to be able to get it right, the least you can do is put some energy behind your thankfulness and start serving him. (laughs) Pastor, I don't feel good enough to serve because we are still living in the flesh where our sin was produced. And if the enemy is unable to take away our salvation, he works to remove the joy of serving. Yes. That's why when you, you need to shake off every thought and statement that is trying to prevent you from doing something for the kingdom of God. Right. Because if the truth be known from this stage and this pastor all the way back to that sound booth and all the people in between... If we're going to take the measuring stick out of God's Word and use it against people, none of us are going to measure up to be able to serve. Pastor, you don't understand. I still have a problem cussing. I've got a problem drinking. I've got a problem of Internet porn. You don't understand, Pastor. I've still got issues. We all have issues. Because those of us that are not cussing out loud are cussing underneath our prayer. And those of you that are not drinking Jack Daniels are drinking NyQuil, which is the Baptist bourbon, all right? You with me? You with me? You with me? Y'all laugh all you want to. I've told you this before, and I'm going to say it for all of our... Yeah, Jesus turned water to wine, but the Baptist turned it to grape juice. All right, so I want you to understand, you'll get that Tuesday. If you don't know it, you're not Baptist. Find somebody here that looks stuck up, they're Baptist, and ask them what that means. But I should be able to serve after <laughs> stuck up. I'm confusing the Baptist and the Methodist. All right, so I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure this out now. It's simply that the enemy's trying to persuade you that you cannot be effective. That's the reason to pursue a life of holiness, and we act like we have a choice. But when you were saved or redeemed from sin, you are no longer your own. See, we don't preach this part of salvation. We just want to keep you out of hell. We just want to get you to where you can sleep at night knowing you're going to heaven. 
But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Because you got to understand, if you have been redeemed, that means you have been purchased. If you have been purchased, that means you have been bought. If you have been purchased, you have been bought, and you have been redeemed, that means you no longer own what you sold. Are y'all with me? Y'all with me? I lost some of you on the last Baptist joke. I'm sorry. All right, let me bring you back in. Let me bring you back in. So if you have been redeemed, that means you have been purchased. If you've been purchased, that means you've been bought. If you've been bought, that means you no longer have a say. You no longer have a say. That's not me selling you a house and then telling you what color you've got to paint your walls. That's not me selling you a car and telling you how to drive it. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No. When you were purchased and you were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, when you were redeemed, you gave up all your rights of being able to do what you want to do. You said, well, now you sounded like an old holiness preacher. Well, I think maybe our world would be in a better condition if we would go back preaching the old holiness way. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to love you in all of your mess ups, but I would be a bad pastor if I continued to let you mess up. Yeah, yeah. So you got to understand you are a temple of God. The Bible is emphasizing with the result of redemption, you can have freedom from sin, but you've got freedom to serve. Freedom to serve God through Christ. So why are you not serving? How can you tell me that you come in here every Sunday morning and you rejoice over the fact that God has brought you where he's brought you from and we can't get you to do nothing? Why is it that you can tell me that you're so thankful? God, Pastor God. Oh, Pastor, if I had an hour, I could tell you my story. God's done a... Oh, Lord Jesus, he's done so much for me. Really, because I can't tell it by what you're doing. The people that I can tell are thankful about what God has done for them are bombarding me, asking me, what can I do now? What can I do now? Oh, no, no, what can I do now? I need to do something. I need to do something. You got to tell me, Pastor. What can I do now? You need me to go wash the windows? I'm going to go wash the windows. You want me to go clean the toilets? I'll go clean the toilets, Pastor. You want to go work nursery? Let me get saved again, but then I'll go work nursery. Pastor, what is, it, what is it you want me to do? What, what, what is it you want me to do? Hey, if I'm out on the street and I'm thankful for what God did for me, it's not going to be hard to be nice to people who are not nice to me because I'm not looking at them as people that hate me or people that I'm against. I'm looking at them through the eyes of Jesus because I sold my body to God and now I'm looking through the eyes of love toward the people around me. And let me just go ahead and say this for all of you that want to go down this road. And with God's eyes, He don't see color. He doesn't see ethnicity. He doesn't see anything. When He looks through His eyes of love, everybody looks the same. There is only one color that God is looking for, and that's the color of red where He has put His blood over your sin for you to be redeemed so your sin could be paid for. This is the time to take up an offering. Did y'all see that? That was the time right there. How can we fall or how can we fail to rejoice knowing what Christ has saved us from? How about this? Some of you may be sitting here going, well, He's not fully saved me from it. He's still saving me from it because I still have a tendency. I was going to preach. I'm going to preach a message. I am. Remind me. I want to preach this message called, I have the tendency. What do you have? I have a tendency to cuss somebody out. I have a tendency. I have, y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yo, y'all, y'all looking at me like, oh, no, I don't have tendencies. Oh, you, you do have tendencies. I see your Facebook page. You have tendencies. I have tendencies. Oh, I see what you put on Facebook. Some of you people, y'all, y'all don't need to be blocked. Y'all need Jesus. My word. That's why I run from some of y'all. We don't come to me at church because I've already read what you're going through. I don't want to deal with that. I, I've already read that stuff. Man, I've already unfollowed you three times and somehow you still end up on my timeline. I'm just going to start blocking every one of y'all. Y'all, y'all bunch of, for, y- for you people to have the victory, y'all sure don't show it on Facebook. Y'all down all the time. 
I, I would like, here's my, here's, all right, here's my goal for you. All right, this is your challenge. It has nothing to do with this message. This is just a pet peeve of mine. And now that I've got your attention, uh, I'm going to take my time to do this. Promise me that over the course of the next two weeks, you have at least one good day. Would you? Would you? Would you? Would you promise me? Would you promise me that in the next two, I'm not even going to give you a whole month, but in the next two weeks, could you at least have one good day and tell everybody on Facebook you're having a good day? I mean, just one, just one time, just, just one time, and quit sending those subliminal messages that you're trying to get. You're going to post a quote that you really want to tag somebody on, but you won't tag them, so you're going to post it in hopes they see it, and then you're going to feel better about yourself saying, I told her. Subliminal messages trying to get your point across. Would you, and of course, if you will agree to have one good day in the next two weeks, would you raise your hand for me? I want to see two, over the course of the next two weeks, have a good day. I mean, even if you have to leave her, have a good day. I mean, if you have to go spend the night somewhere else, have a good day. If you need to ask for a day off and go to the river and Would somebody please have a good day and notify Facebook and notify your flesh so God can at least say, well, at least they're proud that I've done something in their life. Just have a good day. Amen. Had nothing to do with my message, but I feel better. So today, I'm not going to be spiritual. I'm not going to sit here and say, God bless you. Oh, God bless you. As you leave, hey, God bless you, God bless you. I'm going to say, have a good day. I say, have a good day. (laughs) Two weeks. Two week challenge. Some of you are going to go ahead home today and you're going to knock it out. Well, let's go ahead and try to muster this up right now. (laughs) I feel closer to God on a Sunday than I will on a Monday. I better go ahead and post this thing. (laughs) Is there any way you can schedule this, Pastor, where it can just appear in the next week? Because I'm... I'm feeling holy today, but tomorrow I'm going to want to delete it. Is there any way I can go ahead? How can you be a Christian and never have a good day? How can you come in this church and portray how messed up you've been and what God has delivered you from and you never have a day that you can praise Him? You're going to be so critical to everybody else on the situation you're in now that you have amnesia about where you've been? So how about this? If you have a hard time in your current condition of having a good day, why don't you just have a flashback of what God brought you out of? Yeah, yeah. How about this? Why don't you praise Him that while you may have to get a divorce, at least now you can sleep without wondering if they're going to kill you in your sleep. How how about the fact that you no longer have to put up with them beating you? How about you no longer have to work at a job where everybody's trying to stab you in the back? I may not be making what I want to make now, and I'm not making how much I used to be, but at least I can go into work and at least have a halfway smile. I'm talking about me. At least I can go in and have a halfway smile that i got to put up with church people all day long. They're going to call me with their problems, and I as a pastor got to be in a good mood. i got to be ready to pray at all times. And then you're going to get on Facebook after I pray with you and say, Pastor, I feel better. I feel better. And then I go on Facebook and you're going to cuss somebody out. <laughs> I've done wasted all my time with you. Right. Have a good day. <laughs> all right, so because I've been redeemed, I've got some first-time guests right now looking at me. If you're sitting next to a first-time guest or somebody that looks scared, pat them on the little knee and just say, he's always like this, okay? Just, he's always like this. I can be saved because I've been redeemed. I can serve because I've been redeemed. I'm going to let loose now. Um, I want to preach this third point like Jesus is coming back tomorrow because I want to tell you that I can be settled. See, you don't know what that means yet, but by the time we get done with this place, you're going to be, I mean, you're going to be swinging from the rafters. The whole picture of being redeemed is having a payment be made for your sin. I can be saved because the blood of Christ was used as payment for my sin. I can serve because after where Christ had had to go to get me, the least I can do is rejoice by means of service for the kingdom. But this last point will make you want to run around this church because I can be rest assured that my account has been settled. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. 
And you say, I have no idea what you're saying, Pastor. That's all right. You're about to get it. You're about to get it here in just a second. Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 13. Write this down. Colossians 2, 13. And when you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Transgression. See, see, you, you shout over the word transgressions. I shout over the word all. Amen. Amen. Yeah, because there's some of you that you can look down on others people's faults when it's not your fault. Yeah, it's easy to condemn people of the homosexual sin when you're not having to deal with homosexuality. It's so easy for you to condemn other people for internet porn and for smoking and for tobacco and for alcohol and for drugs because that's not your sin. But had your sin become public, had your sin become public, you would be thankful that He forgives us of all our sins. Of all. Somebody say all. Of all our sins. Yeah, you just want him to forgive you of your sins and you want to leave the sexual predators out there dying and going to hell. But when Christ forgave you of your sin, he also died and shed enough blood to forgive them of their sin. Yeah, so be very careful when you want to go on Facebook and social media and you want to have this attitude like your stuff don't stink anymore. Let me tell you something. The same God that forgave you can forgive them. And if you have grace and mercy in your life, you should be showing grace and mercy to them. But then Colossians chapter number 2 Verse number 14 is really what I want to shout. Having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. How can you sit there and look at me like a new mule looking at a new gate You're sitting there staring at me when I just told you that your bill has already been paid. Y'all get more excited if somebody takes you to Applebee's and you're sitting there going, boy, I sure do hope they offer. You know you do this. You go in prepared to pay, but you walk in with the hopes of somebody else picking up the ticket. Well, maybe not Applebee's, but Bright Star. Bright Star. You don't go to Bright Star hoping you pick up the ticket. You go to Bright Star hoping that whoever's with you. And then you're going to fake all the way through the meal. Oh, no, I'll get it. Oh, no, 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 I'll, no, 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 you don't. We have this through. No, I'm not going to tell them that because nobody pick up our bill. So, so, so we sit there and, and you, you, you fight over who's going to pay the bill. Fight over. Yeah, they're the only ones that's got their wallet out. You're just sitting there. Oh, no, let me get it. And then you get excited. You know that feeling when they pick up the bill and you just realize that you, you have that extra $100 in your account? Y'all get more excited about that than the fact that I just told you that God paid your sin debt. It's been paid for. It's been paid for. The certificate of death has been canceled. The debt has been paid. When the enemy tries to hold you accountable for the sin in your life, when he comes trying to hold things against you, when he constantly tries to keep you in bondage for what you have done, he's standing there and you're standing there with your heavenly Father and the enemy is pointing his finger at you and he's pointing at the books and he's saying if you'll look at the book, you're going to see everything that Mickey has done. You're going to see everything that he's done wrong. You're going to see everything that he said was wrong. He was even a pastor and he was doing these things God and he was doing this and he was doing that he was doing this and he was doing that he was doing this and if you were to look at the records God you would see that Mickey does not deserve to go into heaven much less to have joy on earth of knowing that his sin has been forgiven so he says heavenly father look at the books and the account will tell you and then my God 
my God grabs his book and he says, I don't know what sin you're talking about because when I look at Nikki's account, all I see is it says paid in full. I, I don't I see. I, and it was written. And I know that it's on good authority. I know it's on good authority. I know it's on good authority. You're going to have to get me another mic. I'm about to stretch my throat. Give me another mic so I can preach. I know it's on good authority. I know it's on good authority because it was written in the blood of my son who was sitting here one day. He was sitting here one day and he looked over at me and he said, Daddy, I'll go and I'll be their redeemer. That's when my daddy looked at him and said, Son, you do know it's going to be a painful trip. You do know you're going to have to shed your blood. You do know that you're going to have to give up some things. You do know you're going to have to empty yourself. You do know that you're going to have to go down there and you're going to have to go through some things in life that you never thought you were going to have to go through. And he says, I know it, but I want to be their redeemer. It was his blood that he put on my account that no matter how bad you may think I am and no matter how bad you want to hate on me. God looks at the book and when he sees the book he sees the blood of Jesus Christ and it says paid in full. Somebody praise him for the fact that your account has been paid in full. Somebody praise him. Somebody praise him. Somebody praise him. Praise him that your account has been paid in full. You don't owe anything. Paid. Oh, I wish I had an organ. Paid in full. Paid in full. Somebody say paid in full. Paid in full. Paid in full. But my account's been paid in full. I had a lot of sin. I've had so much sin, I forgot about some of them. I'm only dealing with the big ones right now. But he not only forgave me of my big ones, <laughs> he also forgave me of the little ones. <laughs> he not only forgave me of the ones that everybody knows about, he also forgave me of the ones that nobody knows about. Yeah, he didn't just forgive me. He didn't just forgive me of those sins that I can share in my testimony. He also forgave me of some of those things that nobody going to know about. Yeah, that's going to my death with me. But it doesn't matter because when he looks at the list and he looks at my name, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ writing paid in full is nothing but he says, I have been redeemed. 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 God gave a promise through the prophet Moses saying, stick with me and I will redeem you. Yeah. I will redeem you from your past. Is there anybody here that would just really like to be able to forget about your past? Is there anybody here that while you've walked out of your past, you still have to deal with your past? Yeah, you still have to deal with people in your past. Yeah, he says, I will redeem you from your past. I will redeem you from your current situation. Yeah, we shouting about the past. How about the fact that he's getting ready to move you out of your current situation now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, how, how, how about the fact, yeah, 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 yeah. How, how, about, how about the fact, how about the fact that he was just waiting to see if you were going to praise him? And the fact that you didn't stand, nothing's going to happen. But for those people that stood on their feet today and offered a big shout of praise and put their hands in the air, God said, because you're praising me before it ever happens, that shows me that you have faith in me. And because you have faith in me, I'm going to go ahead and start freeing you and saving you and redeeming you from the current situation that you have in your life. Somebody say amen. I will redeem you. I will redeem you from your many mess ups. I will redeem you from the sin that remains in your life. Yeah, we want to act like that he's forgiven us. How about the fact that we got some people sitting in here today that needs to be forgiven? Yeah, that needs to be forgiven. Something happens when you get this mic, Chris, and an old Baptist voice starts coming out. 
Stick with me and I will redeem you from the 613 laws of the Old Testament. He said, stick with me and I will redeem you from the weight of being guilty of not just one, but being guilty of all of them. He said, stick with me and I will redeem you from the pains of slavery and the pains of bondage that are unable to be removed by yourself. Because if it was up to you, you would have already removed the pain and you would have already removed the bondage and you would have already removed the slavery. But it's not up to you. But thanks be to God, you have been redeemed. And because you have been redeemed, God has removed the pain a bondage for you. I hear God saying to someone who is enslaved today, stick with me and I will redeem you from the sin that has you bound. Stick with me and I will redeem you from the weak moments that you can't seem to control. Stick with me and I will redeem you from giving in to the pressures of addiction. Stick with me and I will redeem you from quitting the drug only to go back to it. Stick with me and I will redeem you from saying you are done with sin only to find yourself in the middle of it again. Stick with me and I will redeem you from the pains that the enemy tries to block and throw in your way. Stick with me and I will redeem you from the haters that seem to find you even when you're not looking for them. Stick with me and I will redeem you from a dead end job and I will cause companies to open just just so they can employ you. No matter that they need 300 people, I'm opening up this business just for you. Stick with me and I will redeem you from what the world says you can't have. God says I will give you that. Stick with me and I will redeem you. I will give you the approval when everybody else said no. Stick with me and I will redeem you. Friends will let you down. Family will let you down. The employer will let you down. Coworkers will let you down. But listen to this little preacher who is wringing wet from all the sweat that's running down my back. God will never let you down. No, 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 no. No, no, he, he will never, never, never. Somebody say never, never, never. 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 You are not too bad. You are not in too bad of a situation. You may already be divorced, but you can't get married again. You may be separated, but you can get back together again. You may be unemployed, but you can get hired again. You may be on your way out, but you can come back in again because he will never let you down. You have been bought with a price, redeemed from the penalty of sin. Now get up from your pitiful attitude and begin rejoice through serving that you have been redeemed.